Good morning uh, and welcome to NASA Ames Research Center for the LCROSS Post-Impact News Conference. My name is Jonas Dino. I'm Public Affairs Officer for uh, the LCROSS mission. On our panel today, we have Daniel Andrews, LCROSS Project Manager, Anthony Colopreet, LCROSS Principal Investigator and Project Scientist, Jennifer Heldman, Coordinator for the LCROSS Observation Campaign, and Michael Wargo, Chief Lunar Scientist for Exploration Systems at NASA Headquarters. After each has spoken, we will be taking questions from the news media. Before we begin, we have a statement from the AIM, our AIMS Center Director, uh, Ms. Pete Warden, Dr. Pete Warden. Good morning. I guess my summary is really cool. This is an exciting and a historic day for NASA and for scientists around the world. Today we kicked up some moon dust and all indications are it's going to be a very interesting uh, set of results. But maybe even more important than the results are some of the other things that have been shown here. LCROSS showed that low-cost, small, innovative satellite missions are able to not only excite the scientific community and the public, but also to gather some really neat science. In addition, this showed the value of teamwork. And the teamwork went across NASA, a number of NASA centers, uh, not just NASA Ames, NASA Goddard, NASA uh, Kennedy Space Center, headquarters, uh, and folks from a number of other centers, universities, particularly the uh, groups that have been making ground-based observations, corporate uh, partnerships, uh, particularly our prime uh, partner, Northrop Grumman, uh, and internationally, we've got scientists around the world working on this. So this is truly a historic day for NASA. It expands and continues uh, our exploration and eventual expansion into the solar system. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to those that made it happen. And by the way, on behalf of NASA, thank you. Thank you, sir. And I know everyone wants to hear from the team, so with that, I will hand it off to Dan. Thank Dan? you, Jonas. Well, good morning. I think it's uh, morning. Uh, the team has been working uh, very hard, especially with this last push, uh, pretty continuously. One of the, uh, one of the benefits of such a, a small team, uh, multiple hats for long hours. Um, the LCROSS mission has been just a, a, a great experience. I'm very proud of this team who's partially represented up here, but there's a whole uh, much larger group of people who have done amazing work and given uh, in, incredibly, frankly, personally and professionally to uh, see this great mission through. Um, the, uh, I'm happy to report that the spacecraft uh, performed beautifully throughout the mission. The operations team drove it well. Um, and uh, you're here today to hear about some of our initial results. Um, I caution people that we've, we've been saying for some time now, it takes a while to comb through the data and make sure that we uh, are reporting uh, accurate and uh, uh, correct data. Um, but we did want to give you a little feel before the, the morning was out on uh, how things went some of the stuff that we saw, and you're going to see some interesting imagery and data uh, from the team today. And so with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Tony. Thank you, Dan. And uh, yes, the first thing that I've learned is how much fun it is to get ready for a press conference. And, and two hours after being up for 36 hours watching this, uh, this ride, um, lesson learned, write that one down. Um, thanks. <laughs> But uh, yeah, it was, uh, uh, everything really worked out well. The, uh, the spacecraft flew uh, perfectly. The instruments performed uh, honestly better than expected in some cases. We got interesting results, and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about those initially, but again, they're just initial results. Uh, it took us most of the time just to get the data, get it calibrated off, off one thumb drive onto another computer and start processing it. So what you're really gonna see is just a first glimpse. And uh, as we get the teams together and get all the other observations in, uh, uh, you know, you'll hear more and more as, as, as the days go on. But uh, I can certainly report there was an impact. We saw the impact. We saw the crater. And we got good uh, measurements, spectroscopic measurements, which is what we needed. 
of uh, the, the impact event. So we have the data we need to actually address the questions we set out to address. And that's the fundamental bottom line. That's what I hope you know, take away today is, I'm not gonna say anything about water or no water, but we got the measurements we need to address the questions. So uh, rather than me talk more, we can go to some of the images uh, uh, first up. So if we go to the first uh, PowerPoint presentation that I have in here. Actually, there's a movie. If we can play that movie first, the AVI. Now we'll start here and then we'll do the movie. This is fine. So we have a variety of cameras, as you all know. The visible camera really is this context camera. And it was really uh, fantastic to actually see this visible camera in our target site and compare it to our target charts and go, yep, that's where we're going. Perfect. Uh, what you see in the center here is the Cabeus Crater uh, at, that we're headed out uh, toward. Uh, the next uh, camera image is, is our near-infrared camera. And this is a camera that was used for uh, uh, flash detection and crater detection, ultimately, uh, as, as, as well as looking for ejecta. And then the next slide shows our thermal camera. And uh, these thermal cameras have always been kind of a, a sweetheart of mine. They've performed uh, very well along with the near-infrared cameras. And uh, so it measures temperature. This is a grayscale, but uh, bright regions are hot, cold regions, are, dark regions are cold. Uh, so these are, I'm going to talk a little bit more about each of these three cameras, and these are uh, some views at about this, the same altitude of the target site as we flew in. Uh, we're probably about 700 or so kilometers above the surface at this point. The next slide uh, shows essentially uh, our view from the near infrared uh, camera at impact, and uh, we're impacting to the, into the shadowed region to the, to the left there. Uh, also, good news is that the shadows rep, uh, that we can really only just have modeled up to this point really look like the model. So the topography that seems uh, very accurate uh, that we're, we've gotten from uh, the previous missions. Uh, next slide shows the uh, mid-infrared uh, flash detection, and it's kind of hard to see in this presentation. I apologize. The uh, the top I've got three insets here. The uh, the larger picture shows the crater. And then the lower left shows a zoom in, and you see that little white speck there. That is the impact flash from 600 kilometers away, seen thermally. So what we're seeing there is the temperature of that impact flash. So we can actually go back and measure how hot it got um, and watch its evolution. You see the flash over a few frames. And the lower right is a zoom in there. You see that the flash is actually several pixels across. Interesting. Don't know what that means. Uh, it could just be a, a smear, it's a 30 frame per second camera. We have to look, interesting though. So what was great is we got a nice definitive detection of the flash um, and uh, we can follow up with that. Uh, next uh, presentation shows some spectrometer data. So one of the things we did actually uh, you know, uh, that you've probably heard me discuss is arrange the observations of this event around the event itself. So there's impact flash. So that's what you saw was impact flash. Uh, we get the instruments in certain settings for that particular moment. Then there's the curtain evolution where uh, ejecta comes up into sunlight, volatiles come up, vapors come up, and we set the cameras for different exposures and integrations for that. And then there's the crater period when we are flying through the debris and uh, vapor cloud, whatever's left, and we actually then try to image the crater we made and learn about the vapor cloud we're, fl we're flying through. This was, uh, as it turns out, a very smart thing to do because what it made us, uh, impacting into the moon is a uh, unpredictable business at best, but what we did was we actually are able to garner different information from each of those periods in our data set. And that's what I'm excited about is, each of those periods flash, we, you saw the thermal flash, we actually, as you'll see in a second, have very good uh, uh, ultraviolet visible uh, spectroscopy of the flash, that's really exciting. Uh, that was totally independent of everything else, so that by itself may constitute enough to answer some fundamental questions. And then we had the ejecta curtain, we watched how that evolved and, and, and looked for that, and then the crater itself, and so we, as you'll see in a minute, we actually saw our crater, we measured its temperature, and uh, we're going to look at that even more closely coming forward. Uh, going forward, what you see here is, oh, back one, uh, back two, you went forward one, there, good. This is uh, uh, visible spectrometer data, so we have an ultraviolet visible spectrometer, and it measures uh, a, a, from the near ultraviolet all the way through red wavelengths. And what you're, what's shown here is a roll-up of all the energy in that spectrometer, the total radiance. 
So you're not seeing spectra here, you're just seeing the toll signal. And what you see here is that the strength of that signal as a function of time along the bottom. So as we're flying in, our field of view of that instrument, what we're seeing is getting smaller and smaller and smaller and looking deeper and deeper into the shadow. And that's exactly what you wanted to do. And uh, all the way to the end where you see that fall off way out towards the end, that's actually when the field of view of our spectrometer dips into total blackness. And so on the far uh, uh, right of that image, you see the, the little cliff, and then you see a little blip right there. And you'll, I'll talk more about that in a minute. And then you see a larger bump. The larger bump, we believe, is probably a, a processing artifact right now uh, that we have to take out. But that little blip is very important. That is uh, actually the flash of the impact that the visible spectrometer picked up. We're very excited about that because that's where you get thermalization of any vapors. Uh, it uh, hopefully will contain OH in it. If there's water there, we'll have to see. Uh, next slide shows the near-infrared spectrometer. So a similar pattern. This near-infrared spectrometer has a, uh, 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 again, a field of view that is getting smaller and smaller. It's the same size, and so it gets uh, fainter and fainter as we dip into shadows. Uh, the, you see that little arrow, and it's indicating a little uh, uh, block that's missing. The instrument actually goes into, as I mentioned, a different mode for flash, and we're just not showing it here. It actually uh, measures the flash energy very quickly, so we uh, attempted to measure it there. And then it comes out of that flash and looks at the ejecta curtain. And the next slide, I think, shows these two kind of overlapped with each other. So uh, what you see is the black curve again is this uh, ultraviolet visible spectrometer, and you see the, uh, the, the, little sh the first short blip uh, is, is the flash. And it's extensive, and it doesn't go all the way down to zero. Mm, very interesting. I'll just say that much about it. It doesn't go to total blackness uh, and like it did before. And the near-infrared spectrometer has a trail off that's a little bit more shallow than expected. So we're going to look at this, but we're really excited that uh, the, these spectrometers look to have captured the, uh, certainly the flash and possibly the ejecta cloud and given us the signal we need to answer the questions we're after. Uh, and then you can see at the end of that, we go deeper and deeper into darkness. And that's actually, next slide's good, because that's, that's what we uh, uh, then start looking for the crater. And this was really fun for me. I was watching us go in, and I gotta say, I, didn't, I was blown away by how long this little spacecraft lasted. Uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna be, it's gonna be fun to see how close we were to the surface when it finally, when we lost contact with the poor, poor guy. Um, but we saw, and it's hard to see again in these pictures, so I've blown it up. That little, those are two images, uh, uh, like a, uh, a third of a second apart from each other in top left, and that arrow's pointing to a little blip, maybe just a pixel or so. But in the sock, we looked up and we saw that little blip appear, and then all of a sudden go skirting across the scene as we were coming in and trying to keep pointing at it. That was the crater we made with the Centaur, and that's what's blown up there. It's uh, at least a pixel across. Towards the end, it's a little bit more than a pixel. And what's great about that is it confirms the actual uh, size of the crater we were predicting. I think it's pretty close to the crater size we were thinking. We have to go back and look, but what's great is, you know, I was uh, maybe not particularly optimistic we would see this crater like this, but we actually got pretty good signal to noise and can actually go back and try to measure the temperature of this crater. That's gonna tell us something about the materials in there. And uh, what's great is Diviner, the uh, instrument on LRO, is making similar measurements uh, with much bigger field of view. And uh, we can really uh, co corroborate those measurements and learn something more. So that's a quick look at uh, some of the camera data, spectrometer data. Uh, we weren't the only ones looking. And so with that, I'm going to actually turn it over to Jen, who's going to describe uh, the broader observational campaign outside of uh, the LCROSS spacecraft. Great. Thanks, Tony. Um, so while we pull up the slides here, um, I just want to echo Pete's comments that this was so cool. This was the greatest thing because uh, I think this is what NASA does well, and it's a really great day uh, to be working here for the Space Agency. And through, uh, through the observation campaign, this is where a lot of the collaboration and cooperation came in. We had a great number of teams um, that were observing, and I'll show you a list of those as well. We collected a tremendous amount of data through the observation campaign. I should uh, mention that the philosophy behind the observing campaign was one of cooperation and collaboration. So we brought this team together under the umbrella of observing LCROSS, and so everyone's been working together. Uh, we're looking at each other's data, sharing data, collaborating with the spacecraft and all the other space orbiting assets that have collected data as well, because that's how we're going to learn the most from this, uh, from this unique experiment that we just did today. 
So I want to give you just a flavor of some of the types of data that we collected. Um, we have images, we have video, we have graphs with squiggly lines that scientists love. So we have a little bit of something for everyone. And I can only show you a snapshot here uh, given time restrictions, but there is a lot more that's available. Um, and a lot of this will be posted on the NASA website as well, uh, so you'll be able to go there. <coughs> Just as a reminder of who was able to observe, so we have ground-based observations and we also have space-based observations. For the ground-based observations, um, where the moon was up and where it was dark, uh, which is what you need for these types of measurements, um, was from west of the Mississippi all the way out through, say, Hawaii. And so that's where our observatories have been clustered. And so that's where you'll see a lot of these observations coming from, the, south, the southwest U.S. Um, and then out to Hawaii. We also had several space-based assets that we're observing, and I'll talk about those as well. So to give you a sense of some of the types of data that we have, um, as I mentioned that the observation campaign, everyone worked together on this. And uh, clear skies all around. We really lucked out with the weather. That was fantastic. So um, all the folks that were signed up to observe had clear skies, collected data. Uh, we had no instrument issues or anything. So we had all, um, everything was nominal for the observatories. So what we're seeing here up on one of the maps, this is the Lunar South Pole map. I want to give you a sense of where we actually went. I want to get you familiar with this south polar region of the Cabeus Crater, uh, where we impacted. So hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a better appreciation for where we went and be able to pick it out yourself. So this is an image from uh, New Mexico State University and uh, Marshall Space Flight Center, another one of the NASA centers that we worked with. This is the lunar south pole map. So you can see at the bottom, the target crater Cabeus is actually labeled. This is an image mosaic, and this is part of the uh, cooperation that happened before tonight. We've been working on this for quite some time, doing rehearsals and doing test runs um, to make sure that the pointing accuracy is correct. It's not trivial to point these large telescopes um, at a very specific region on the moon. It's difficult to observe the moon from the ground. The moon's very bright. So typically astronomers don't really like looking at the moon. They're used to looking at very faint objects, galactic, extragalactic objects. Uh, the moon moves at a different rate than uh, a lot of other things that the astronomers observe. So it took a lot of planning uh, to be able to make this work. And the amount of data that we've gotten in already is a testament to the success that we've had uh, based on all of that prep work that we did before. So this is just an example of one of the uh, impact, or one of the mosaics that we had um, ahead of time to help with uh, targeting. If you go to the next slide. So here's a zoomed in uh, region of that. So you're still looking at the South Pole. You can see several of the uh, nearby craters are labeled. And then you also see the expected plume area that's labeled um, there towards the bottom. And I want to call your attention to there's a very bright sort of ridge line that goes across. And then behind that is a very dark region. This is where we're, the uh, plume is expected to have come up uh, based on our impact location. So this is very good. Um, if we go to the next slide. Give you another, um, just another example of where, where these telescopes were pointing and where they're expecting this plume to be based on our impact location. This is actually um, a rendering that was created by our colleagues at uh, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Um, this is using LOLA data, the Lunar Orbiter Laser Altimeter instrument that's aboard the LRO, the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter spacecraft right now. Um, and so using this laser altimetry data, um, our colleagues at Goddard were able to create renderings of the lunar surface for us. So we had even better ideas of what to expect when we were going in. And you can see a white line, it's, we call it the dipstick, uh, showing the location of where the uh, impact predict um, was for the centaur. Uh, so if we go to the next slide. So here's another uh, image from the Apache Point Observatory in New Mexico. I'm showing you this, uh, these types of images again because I want you to be able to pull out that brighter uh, ridge line that's there and then the dark that's behind it, and that's the Cabeus region where we are impacting. And we have images like these at different lighting conditions and different tilts of the moon um, so that we would know exactly where to be pointing. Go to the next slide. Um, here's an image um, from Mount Akea in Hawaii. This is from the Keck Guider. This was taken last night. So uh, we did a practice run last night as well, so that we knew exactly where we would be. And I just want to point out one of the techniques that's used to collect these observations. So you see several different uh, craters are labeled there in different waypoints. And so typically, um, in astronomy, if you're trying to find something in the sky, you might do star hopping. You know where the stars are. They pretty much stay in the same spot, and so you can find the patterns and hop around. We had to adapt that technique for working on the moon. And so looking at the different lighting conditions and looking at the region where we're impacting, picked out various waypoints so that the astronomers could move the telescopes and then keep them synced up and keep them locked on the particular region where we needed to be pointed. And you can see um, the predict area for the L-cross impact is also labeled there. If you go to the next. Um, so here's a sample list of some of the observatories that we have confirmed data was collected. 
Uh, there's a much bigger list here, but I just want to give you a flavor for uh, the variety. These are the professional telescopes and the geographic locations. Uh, so we have the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope um, located out in Hawaii, Apache Point Observatory in New Mexico, uh, NASA's Infrared Telescope Facility in Hawaii, the MMT Observatory in Arizona, Magdalena Ridge Observatory in New Mexico, uh, the Keck out in Hawaii, Gemini North in Hawaii, and also the Subaru Telescope. Uh, the Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute have telescopes in both Arizona and Korea. Mount Wilson down in Southern California. Uh, the Air Force Telescopes out in Hawaii as well. The Allen Telescope Array up in Northern California. Palomar Observatory in California. Lick Observatory not too far away from here at NASA Ames. Um, so these are just a sampling of some of the professional ground-based um, observatories that have successfully collected data of the LCROSS impacts. Uh, we also had several space-based observatories that were also observing LCROSS. Uh, can we go back? Back to the, yeah, thanks. So um, HST, Hubble Space Telescope, newly refurbished. That was excellent. We needed that um, to enable these LCROSS impacts. So uh, it's a great way to use this NASA asset to support another NASA mission. Um, and we have confirmation we had imaging um, from HST at first. We have confirmed that that has taken place. Um, we are following that up with some spectroscopy. So we're looking at the exosphere of the moon to see how it could be perturbed, um, as Tony had mentioned, from the impacts. And those observations are going on now, and we're also taking some in several hours, and then we're taking another one tomorrow to see how that exosphere actually evolves and may relax back. So we have confirmation that HST, can, keep going, go back, yeah, thanks. So um, HST uh, operations were nominal. Um, expecting data, it'll be downlinked soon. Uh, fortuitously, we'll be able to get that data down in about an hour or so as for our first dump. Mm -hmm. uh, there's also the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. So this is our sister mission that we, we've been working with LRO um, quite closely throughout this entire process. We launched with LRO um, back in June from the Kennedy Space Center down in Florida. LRO is in orbit around the moon right now, so they are in a great position uh, to be supporting LCROSS, and they have done a tremendous job. Um, they have been observing the impact location before impact, so they've been helping a lot with the site selection and characterization of where we are impacting. Uh, they're taking observations during the impact as well, and uh, we hear that that went well. And they're also doing follow-up observations afterwards. Since they're in, an, they're in lunar orbit, they're in a great place to take follow-up observations as Tony had mentioned before, that are very complementary to the data that were co have been collected from the LCROSS shepherding spacecraft. So we are working very uh, closely with LRO, and we uh, actually appreciate their support a lot. Um, there's also a few other satellites that we have uh, that have been collecting data. There's a Swedish radio telescope called ODIN, which is in Earth orbit. Um, they have successfully uh, collected data during the LCROSS impacts. That data is already back down on the ground, and uh, it's being processed right now. Also, we have the Iconos satellite was turned towards the moon. We have confirmation that they have collected their data. It will be downlink soon, and so we're, uh, we're, we had nominal operations, so we're looking forward to seeing that data. And also the GOI-1 satellite was also, it's in Earth orbit, um, an Earth-looking satellite, turned it towards the moon. Uh, they successfully collected data during the LCROSS impacts. The data has been downlinked to the ground, and so we're expecting to be able to see that uh, later today. Okay, next slide. So now I want to show you um, just a sampling of some of the images and data that was collected uh, during the LCROSS impacts. Um, we're still working in the process of processing and analyzing this data. So as Tony mm -hmm. mentioned, we're not going to make any claims about uh, the implications, water, no water, plume, whatever. Um, we're just trying to give you a flavor of the various types of data that we have that are being processed. And as Tony mentioned before, we have collected the data that we needed. We collected the data that we set out to get, and so we're thrilled about that. And um, as scientists, we're very excited to delve in and uh, start the analysis. So here you're seeing a picture from the NASA IRTF, the Infrared Telescope Facility, um, out in Hawaii. Um, you can see, you should be able to pick out, you can see that brighter line, that brighter ridge, and then the darker area behind it, that's the Cabeus Crater. Um, they were on target, acquired the target, were able to hold the target, and collected data. Um, you can see an arrow pointed to the plume location um, where the impact uh, predict was expected to occur. They're currently analyzing the data, and so we also have spectra as well that are coming, and so uh, we're in the process. So I just want to report that uh, we had a lot of good observations from Hawaii. I won't be able to show them all, uh, but this is just an example. Uh, next. Um, here's an image from the Canada-France-Hawaii telescope. This is also out in Hawaii. Um, this is Christian Vallée, is the director of the CFHT, collected this data. Now I'll point out, so you, can be, you should be able to pick out Cabeus by now. So you've got that bright ridge, I'm sort of towards the middle, with the dark background behind it, uh, very good optimal viewing conditions. 
And you see two dark spots, um, one right in the middle of the ridge and then one above the ridge. This is where they're taking uh, much more detailed measurements and will be analyzing the data now looking for water. So the reason that there are two spots where they're collecting this data, one is on the ridge um, where you'd expect to see something if, uh, kicked up by LCROSS, and then there's one that's off of the impact location for calibration purposes where you expect to see no change. And so that way you can have a comparison point um, to see if you see cha any change detection in the area where LCROSS was intended to hit. So that analysis is uh, going on right now and we'll be able to uh, report back as soon as that's done. Uh, next. Uh, this is a spectacular image um, from the Palomar Observatory using their adaptive optics uh, mechanism. So you can see, you see the bright ridge and then you also see the dark behind it. And this is taken down in Southern California. Uh, we're very excited about this type of imagery. Uh, we're going to do some more post data processing, uh, do enhancements and look at the other series, uh, images that are in the series as well. I uh, we just wanted to give you a flavor of the types and the quality of the image data that we have been able to collect from the ground. Uh, next. And um, for the scientists, we have squiggly lines, which are very exciting. Uh, Tony explained, these are spectra, so we're looking, um, we're looking in different wavelengths. So this is looking in the near infrared. This is from the MMT Observatory in Arizona. Uh, this is Faith Belis and her team um, have been doing a tremendous job. And so what you see are one spectra that's before the impact of the centaur and one that's after the impact of the centaur. And um, anyone can tell that those two squiggly lines are different. We don't know what that means yet. We have to go and interpret the data and analyze it. Um, it's been uh, some preliminary uh, pr reductions that have gone on, but we have to look at this more closely. But what we're seeing is that there's something interesting that's going on. And Tony mentioned a lot of interesting things we're seeing in the spacecraft data. And so now we really have to go back and do our homework very meticulously and try and understand um, what's going on in all these data sets and try and come up with the most coherent story. Um, in terms of spectra as well, uh, the Kitt Peak Observatory um, also detected um, a flash with a sodium flash. So we had um, some emission of sodium that was, that was happening, a very strong um, indication, very brief, but very strong. And so that folds into the story as well. So there are some detections from even from the ground based um, as to what was happening at the time of impact and shortly thereafter. And so we're looking to bring all these data sets together um, to try and understand what's going on. Um, I have a few videos that I'd like to show as well. I should mention, yeah, we, can measure, we measured the sodium line, or can, in our in spectrometer our as well. So, right. yeah. so we can cross-correlate that. Yeah, mm -hmm. excellent. Okay, so the first video that we have playing here, so this is interesting. So this is, um, this is from the Vatican Advanced Technology Telescope, uh, compliments of Dave Harvey and Chris Johnson um, in southeastern Arizona. And what you're looking at is a video of the Centaur taken about six hours before impact. So if you look in the center, you see a bright dot that sort of stays the same. So they are tracking on the centaur. This is after separation. And then you see stars that are moving across. So we can use this information um, to actually track the centaur, which is very, very interesting. Uh, if we go to the next video, this is a video from the Magdalena Ridge Observatory. This is out in New Mexico. This is from Mark Bowie and um, Eileen Ryan out there. And this is a neat video too. If you look in the center of the red circle, you can see the centaur and then you see the nearby stars that are streaming by as the centaur actually moves across the sky towards the moon. So we'll be looking at this data um, in even more detail as well. Okay, and if we go to the next video, so in these, these are videos that were taken uh, during the time of impact um, from a several different observatories. This one is from the 3.5 meter uh, telescope at Apache Point. Uh, this video runs 15, it's sped up, 15 seconds before impact uh, through one minute and 45 seconds post impact. Uh, this is compliments of New Mexico State University and NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. And so you can see this is tilted. These are, we haven't rotated them yet, but you can see up and down, you can see that bright ridge and then Right behind that, you see the dark part, so you know that you're looking at Cabeus Crater. Um, so we have this type of imagery. I want to show you a few other videos that we have to show you the range of scales that we have of the different uh, videos and images, um, because we purposely have done this to collect a wide ri range of different types of data so we can get as much information as we can. So here, for example, is another movie. Um, this is a wider field of view. This is the MMT Observatory at Mount Hopkins. Um, and so as you can see, this one is more zoomed out. And so this is a time lapse that goes on for a while. And so we can look at different scales um, throughout before, during, and after impact. And that's what we'll be doing after this. Uh, if we go to the next video.
Okay, so now you can see, so this is also from the MMT observatory, um, same place, but now you're more zoomed in. And so now you're looking at higher resolution. And so you can see the, the lighter band, and then you can see the darker part um, looking around Cabeus Crater. This is at the, the 6.5 meter guide camera uh, with no filter, and this goes um, throughout the course of the impact. And so we can look at all these different scales and try and put all these pieces together. I'm also looking at the data from the shepherding spacecraft and also the data from the orbiting assets that will be um, available probably to us later this afternoon um, once all that data is downlinked and such. So I hope I leave you with the message that we have a tremendous amount of data that was collected through the observing campaign, uh, ground-based and space-based. Uh, the team has worked together phenomenally uh, to make sure that this happens. And um, we'll continue to work together with uh, the LCROSS science team um, and try and put the pieces together. It's going to be it's going to be exciting. And now I'll hand it over to Mike Margo. <laughs> Thanks an awful <laughs> lot, Jen. Well, you can tell by everything that we've heard here that you've been drinking from a fire hose. There is an enormous amount of data that we've uh, we've gotten today, not just from uh, from LCROSS, but from assets around the world. Uh, and it's going to be a, a little tough for me to uh, try to bring the whole thing together, uh, but I'm going to try to take things up and bring you some context for uh, what LCROSS has, has meant for exploration systems, uh, for science, and for, and for NASA. And really, the one thing that I think really stands out here is this is NASA at its very best. What you're seeing here is exploration and science working together to provide great information for both. This is going to change the way we look at the moon scientifically and inform uh, our abilities to and our planning for continuing to explore the solar system. Uh, we have clearly an outstanding team that has just done a magnificent job. Uh, they took a advantage of a, an opportunity that was made available to them they were nimble. They delivered an outstanding spacecraft on time and within budget. Uh, this is a great lesson uh, for NASA. It's a new tool in our toolbox for how we can continue to explore. Uh, it all started and uh, it continued starting at the very top uh, with the associate administrators uh, of, of exploration systems, starting with Doc Horowitz and Rick Gilbrecht and, and now Doug Cook. Uh, and of course, we can't forget the uh, outstanding support that we got from the center director here at Ames, Pete Warden. Uh, having that kind of support, uh, let this team go off and do what they needed to do to be successful today. This is really a story of teamwork, and I think you've heard that certainly from Jen, but it's bigger than that. Uh, we have uh, not just the other NASA missions of, uh, of LRO and the Hubble Space Telescope, but other international missions that were key in helping us uh, develop the planning for the impact uh, as well as the analysis that's being done. Uh, it started with uh, getting uh, high resolution uh, altimetry information from our colleagues at JAXA in Japan with the Kaguya spacecraft. Uh, we also were able to get uh, radar data from the Chandrayaan-1 spacecraft from India. And an important instrument for this in helping targeting uh, where LCROSS was going to impact was our lunar exploration neutron detector on Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and that's provided by Russia. Uh, Jen gave a really uh, uh, extensive discussion of the, the, the teamwork that we got from uh, astronomers both here in the United States as well as around the world. Uh, what we see is that the success here today is really our LCROSS team really being able to stand on the shoulders of an awful lot of other teams that have really done an outstanding job today. Uh, when we step back and look at what the potential for the results are, um, it almost seems like a dichotomy to me. It's both timely as well as timeless. Uh, over the course of the last couple of weeks, we've really been thinking about the moon in a different way. Who thought just a month or so ago that we'd be talking about 
the water cycle or the hydration cycle of the moon. Well, now we do think that way. We used to think of the moon as this desolate, unchanging place over millions and even billions of years. Now we're seeing that there's a dynamic to the moon that's really changing on a day-by-day, month-by-month kind of basis. So we're really looking at an international effort now across a number of spacefaring nations uh, of looking at the moon and just prodding the moon to give up her, uh, her deepest and darkest secrets. And we're seeing a perfect example of that uh, today. But not only is this timely in providing an important piece of the puzzle of uh, water on the moon, but also this data is timeless. This data is going to be available to NASA and uh, the other uh, explorers to plan for the future and how we're going to explore the solar system. That data is going, and that information is going to be there when we need it. You know, when I was trying to get some sleep last night, I was laying back there and I just went back about 40 years. Now about 40 years we know was when Apollo 11 landed. I had just graduated from high school from uh, a small town in Western, Western Pennsylvania called Clareton. And of course, you know, after graduation, a bunch of us are sitting around saying, what, well, what are you going to do? And you know, I remember saying that one of the reasons I'm going to college is that I want to work with NASA. I want to explore. I want to explore through science. I want to continue to explore the moon. Well, that's exactly what we've been doing today. And I'm sure that there are an awful lot of young explorers out there right now that are thinking and, and dreaming the same kind of dreams that I've had and, and, I, and I continue to have. And that shows that you know, one of the really outstanding things that NASA does and does best, and that is we make dreams come true. And we make dreams come true for, for us as individuals, for us as a nation, and, and, and for the world. Uh, you know, we've all had our, our thoughts of what's been happening today. Well, you can imagine around the, around the country there are uh, an awful lot of other folks who've been thinking about this. And we're lucky enough to have with us uh, the message from uh, some folks I think we might want to hear from. Uh, we have Doug Cook, who's the Associate Administrator for the Exploration Systems Mission Directorate, Lori Garver, the Deputy Administrator of NASA, and Charlie Bolden, the NASA Administrator. Hi, Rusty, Dan, Tony, and uh, all of your team. I'm here with Lori Garver and Doug Cook. Uh, we're at the museum in Washington, D.C. Sorry we couldn't be out there with you, but we were here and uh, the excitement was incredible. Thanks very much for the great job you all did. Uh, please give everybody our best, best wishes and, best, and congratulations on this, and I look forward to seeing you all very soon. Hey, congratulations, team. Uh, here at the museum, we had families, we had uh, members of the general public literally coming in off the street, pointing at the screen. This is what NASA delivers best. Thank you so much. It's a great day. Yes, and I want to say a, a special thanks to the, to the NASA team, uh, led by Dan Andrews and the Northrop Grumman team, who have done a fantastic job on a cost cap, low cost um, spacecraft that they did a remarkable job through a lot of adversity along the way, but delivered and, and I was watching the accuracies along the way and it just put it, you guys put it right where it, where it was supposed to go. So I'm, I'm pleased as I can be. Thank you. Go L Cross. <laughs> very nice. And now Jonas. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now that we have our uh, uh, Things done. We'll, we'll take questions from the audience. We have uh, John Johnson here, then we'll go over here, and then Mike Meacham at, at, after the two gentlemen in front. Uh, John Johnson, Los Angeles Times. Uh, you're, you're all talking about this as though it's a big success, but one of the things that the public was out there to see today and that we were expecting to see was a debris cloud, and we saw nothing. How do you know this is a success and that uh, it didn't just hit bedrock and nothing came up? Uh, that's, that's for me. Well, we need to go back and look at the data and see what, what it says. Uh, that's, uh, exploration has uh, surprises in it. 
I'm certainly glad we uh, built our mission plan, our science plan around all aspects of uh, the impact, for sure. It, it built in that robustness. Um, I, we need to go and carefully look at the images, you know, see what's in them. Uh, certainly what's streamed out to the video is not at the same fidelity as what we get fresh off the spacecraft. So we just need to look a little bit more closer before we conclude anything about an ejector cloud or not. Yeah. So do you know, was there one or, or not? I see something in the spectrometer data, but I can't say anything more than that. The spectrometers are more sensitive to the cam than the cameras. So uh, we've got to go back and look. It, the data is three hours, two and a half hours old. So we'll be meeting later this afternoon after getting some rest. Uh, the science team will. And we'll be able to delve into it right away and get more answers. Uh, hi, Peter Henderson from Reuters. Um, Tony, I guess this is for you as well. Uh, if you can see a, um, what did you say, a sulfur flash, uh, does that, why? Sodium. Sodium, Sodium. flash. Um, can't you see if there's a hydrogen oxygen flash as well? Yes, we can. Great. Was there? I have not looked yet. Oh, come on. I have not. <laughs> I spent the last hour making those images I showed you. Uh, we have the spectra, we have the flash data, and uh, you can bet that's the first place I'm going after this is to, uh, to go back and look at the spectra itself. We have not honestly looked at the spectra themselves, except to do a quality check on the radiance figures I, I showed. It's just that I think, aside from the ejecta cloud, that's the thing we're all wondering. Can you just call your buddies who are probably looking at the data right now and let us know? <laughs> I can, but I think they're all in the audience, actually, <laughs> right now. So, uh, um, yeah, there's Kim saying, no, she's not. So, uh, no, we, uh, uh, we just got to sit back and be, be careful. We don't want to, again, it's, we're, life is full of surprises. We want to be careful, not make a false negative or a false positive claim. Uh, I'm excited we saw variations in the spectra because that means we saw something, and it was... Uh, not just blackness. And so the information's there, we just need to get to it. Do you think you'll know later this afternoon then whether there's water uh, or ice? I very may, we, I probably will, but I'm not gonna tell you, no. <laughs> <laughs> Until we have a consensus amongst team members. HST data is just coming down now. They're looking at OH emissions. Uh, LAMP on LRO's looking multiple orbits. You know, we're, we're gonna take our time and get a, a, a you know, build up a, a case for water um, in, in the ejecta if it's there, or a case against it if it's not there. And then understand, if, if we're seeing variations, what do these variations mean? We've got to understand that uh, before we say anything, honestly. Um, so I'm thrilled that not only us saw variations, that's a very good sign, and the spectra. The spectra is where the science is at. It's where the uh, information is contained. So uh, that's, that was our most uh, uh, high, highest priority data set. So I'm glad we got that. Uh, we are going to work on this feverishly, as you might expect, and we'll, we're going to keep everyone abreast as, as it goes forward. This is Frank Braun from the Brown Journal of World Affairs. This is really a two-part question here. First part has to do with the Hubble telescope. Do you, do you expect that They'll, if there was a plume, there would be an image of that plume more distinctly uh, observable from the images from the Hubble, or have there been? Uh, the, the way we've structured the Hubble observations is highly focused on spectroscopy. So Tony's been harping on this, that the spectroscopy is where the science is. Not and so, the visible. And so we're using, yeah. while well, we're looking at the spectra, you know, mm -hmm. looking at the wavelengths, to get that diagnostic fingerprint of, if anything perturbed the exosphere, what is that, when did it happen? So that's the, that's the primary. Yeah, the, the HST cannot look at the moon except in the most narrow filters right. uh, because it is so bright. So the way we've uh, coordinated with HST is for them to look off of the limb of the moon and do long integration stairs to look for OH emission lines and vapor, vapor cloud emissions. So that's the purpose of HST. Second part of the question is, if I understand this correctly, then there is a doubt whether there in fact was a plume or not. Uh, we uh, just haven't been able to see it clearly in our image data yet, so we need to go back and look at it more closely. Yeah, if I could make one more comment, uh, and that is we're, 
right now you can almost think, uh, or a number of folks are thinking that, hey, it's over. But if there is the remnants of the disturbances to the, to the exosphere, they are far longer lived than just the uh, material being ejected and then falling back to, uh, to the surface of the moon. So there will be ongoing observations to look at uh, any uh, perturbances or any changes in the, in the exosphere around the, uh, the impact site. And, and those observations that uh, go on uh, have the advantage of having two impacts. We only had one to look at from the Shepard spacecraft. They get to see the Shepard spacecraft, any vapor cloud that could have been produced from that as well. I'm Dave so Perlman. we just won't know for oh, a while yet. Sorry, Tony. Dave Perlman from the San Francisco Chronicle. Uh, Tony, is there any evidence at all that the shepherding satellite on its way down into the crater flew through a vapor cloud or anything else resembling that? We got very good high signal to noise data on our side viewing spectrometer. So I honestly need to look closely at it. Um, I, I don't want to say yes or no at this point. We, I, I just need time to look at it with the team. But we got, it was, it was honestly probably the highest signal to noise data we, we could hope for. So if there's something there, uh, we're probably going to have a good chance of seeing it. Uh, the fact that we saw a remnant crater uh, and, and we had data as far down as we had is very promising, very hopeful because we, we would get into the deepest part of any kind of vapor cloud that existed. Uh, just on my initial eyeballing from that, those last few images of the crater, it looks to be about the size of what we were predicting. So that was very encouraging. It filled a full pixel of the camera towards the end and even a little bit beyond, which means it was probably in the 18 to 20 or more meter range. And, and to follow that up, <clears throat> would the mass of ejecta be likely to conform to the predictions you made? I won't say predictions, guesses you made. Predictions, they were predictions, we didn't just guess. But uh, um, uh, that remains to be seen. I, I, I can't answer that right now. Can't answer it. Okay, now we have um, Mike. Did the, uh, one, of, one of the uh, points that I heard early on was that you were concerned about whether the centaur would spin properly so that it would go in in right and therefore the shepherding spacecraft could follow. Did, how did all that part of the mission actually go? Uh, the tip-off seemed very clean. Uh, we have, and that again was nice, is our cameras worked very well. Again, this is uh, where I was a bit surprised how well they worked, that we were able to essentially track the centaur all the way up to the end of our operation very clearly so we can actually derive that, that rate the images you saw of the uh, centaur coming in that the telescopes made, you can kind of see them flicker or come and go. That uh, could be possibly due to a tumble. We think there was, probably, there was some small tumble to it, which is actually not necessarily a bad thing. It's, uh, we kind of wanted to avoid a very peculiar or particular impact, perfectly end on or perfectly flat. Um, and in any case, uh, we can go back and look and see what kind of a tumble rate there is. So we have the, again, we have the information. We just need to go back now and, and really sift through it. Okay. Uh, next, uh, please uh, remind everyone to please state your name and your affiliation. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ivan Semenek with Discovery Channel Canada. Immediately after the impact, there was some discussion about whether the gain on the camera, especially the visible camera, was set right to actually see the plume. I'm wondering if that has now been ruled out as a scenario for the... For the no, uh, no it, it, it hasn't. That's, setting gains on cameras is tricky. You know, most people get a couple tries at this. And uh, our, our visible camera actually has an auto gain. Um, uh, and it's fixed in auto gain. So for the impact, we go to our near-infrared cameras where we can control the gain. And we were actively controlling in, uh, uh, Kim Enico, the payload scientist in the SOC, did a spectacular job managing the exposures, but also the, the uh, data rate. We have a fixed data rate. It's no storm forward, so we have to live within that. And actually, as we come in, the image size changes as the complexity of the terrain changes. So we're constantly having to actually manage both those real time. <coughs> uh, we need to go back and look. We, uh, I think Kim and, and the team, the payload team, Mark Shirley, the payload lead, and, and the flight director and command, did a spectacular job. We uh, 
typically, if we have a problem, we drop images. We, they, they, we, they don't get through. I think we maybe had 40 images dropped out of thousands. So uh, we did really good there. Uh, the gain, what's nice about these cameras is they, they've got a, a pretty large dynamic range. And one of the things we need to go back to and, and is, is look closely. Just looking at it there, you see bright peaks and a dark background. We need to go in there, do some co-adding, some stretching, and see what we can see. We just haven't had the chance to do that. Yeah. Just a quick follow-up for Jennifer. I know the second impact would have been smaller than the first one. Was the expected debris plume, was that also expected to have been seen from the Earth observing angle? Oh, uh, from the Earth, it, yeah. Yeah, just yeah. barely maybe. Just, uh, it's a denser spacecraft, so it has a little bit higher flight. Velocity, we were hoping, thinking. But in any case, as Mike Wargo pointed out, the vapor plume, if it hit volatiles, uh, can expand at a considerably faster rate. It doesn't have gravity pulling down on it like the grains do as, as much. So uh, uh, yeah, hopefully that did produce a little bit extra stuff for, uh, for LRO and, and HST and some of the other assets. Hi, I'm Teresa Garcia with ABC7 News in San Francisco. So if there is no water discovered, will there be an L cross 2? And if you haven't found water, is there anything else you're looking for there? Oh, boy. An L cross 2. Can I finish L cross 1 first? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, if there's no water, I, you know, science is science. It's, 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 um, we, we need to see what we see, you know, what made these changes in the spectra, first of all. Was it an instrument response, or was there really something there? If we don't see water, what does, that tells us something about the processes, where we hit, uh, did we hit, somebody mentioned bedrock, or did, but when we go back and look at the maps and the data, no, we hit into fluff. Well, what does that say? Why didn't we see the water? It means it's in a certain distribution. You know, we have to make, go through that whole process of, of piecing it together, the puzzle together. So if we see water, if we don't see water, both those represent two separate individual uh, unique pieces of the puzzle that we're going to fit in with all the other pieces. And uh, certainly L cross does provide a strategic direction forward for whatever the agency decides to do. Uh, it is a, an experiment, a sample, two samples in, in a particular location. And uh, that data is now available to carry us forward and decide what we do next. Were you looking for anything else other than water? Uh, we're looking for just about everything. We're going someplace we've never been before. So uh, we're primarily interested in what's the source of the hydrogen. So it could have been water, hydrated minerals, adsorbed water, organics, you know, who knows. Um, uh, but the fact that we see a sodium flash, wow, that's really interesting. That's telling us something about the moon that we have to think about. Um, you know, something about this atmosphere around the moon, which is in, in part potentially responsible for the migration of water. So, um, I, no, there, there's a lot more in, in this than just the water, honestly. And I think Mike mentioned how this, this, this data is gonna keep giving for a long time. Uh, ever since the swing by of the moon uh, four months ago, we took some very unique data sets. That will be released very soon to the public. And then this data, after it gets through quality checks, uh, will be re released in uh, hopefully in a few months, honestly. So um, it remains to be seen what's in it. We just don't know yet. OK. Any other questions in the audience? Sure. Uh, hi. Ken Chang, New York Times. Um, I was wondering, were there any signs of a plume in any of the Earth-based observations? And I know a couple of those telescopes said they, have, they definitely did not see the plume, including Palomar. Uh, well, I wouldn't say definitely uh. for any of them yet, uh, because as Tony mentioned, it's so early, and the ground-based teams are still analyzing their data. So we're just looking at the very preliminary you know, images to give a sense of the types of data that have been collected. Uh, but it's just too early to tell to make that determination. OK. Um, and follow up, I know you said most the most important data is the spectra, but if it turns out there is no plume, what do you lose? Uh, I, I think what you lose is um, some estimation of the total excavation, uh, what the, the, the total excavation mass. That said, uh, we imaged the crater. So we actually have some data that we weren't honestly counting on to help us 
fill in that hole. Um, so uh, we lose some. We lose, uh, you know, what we hoped to get out of the ejecta cloud was an ability to say, aha, we see this much stuff, this much dirt, and we can somehow relate that to how much actually came out of the crater. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to, if, if we don't see ejecta, and I'm not convinced it's not in our data yet. I'm not at all convinced that. We've got to look. Um, we've got to go back and, and, and use a combination of the data we have to fill in that missing gap if, if, it's, it, if it's indeed missing. But uh, again, our, our primary objectives are what is that hydrogen? Honestly, the images don't answer that question. The spectroscopy answers that question. So that's why um, uh, when, when I saw actually the spectra, I was like, we got something here. This is good. Okay. Tony, hi. Uh, this is uh, Mike Swift with the San Jose Mercury News. Um, can you give us some sense of the timetable it's going to take you to build the case either for or against water? Is that a matter of days, weeks, months? And hypothetically, those little blips that you saw in the spectra, what hypothetically could that mean? <laughs> no, I, uh, uh, you're right, days, weeks, months. Yeah. Um, <laughs> next I was question. asking you to make a <laughs> Yeah, no, um, uh, yeah. Uh, the timetable I've set forward for the team, and I'm challenged the team, Alcross is unique in every single way. I mean, the way, one, we kind of lay it all out there. We just swing by, we turn on streaming video. Boy, we hope this works. You know, in the same way here. It's, boy, we hope this works with the instruments, the spacecraft. Uh, it's a real-time mission. We never repeat anything twice, I think, um, on this mission. So we, we're at two hours. This is our two-hour mark after impact. Uh, then we have a two-day mark that the team, I, most of the science team is here. Uh, we're going to get together later this afternoon, tomorrow, look at the data, scratch our heads, uh, fight over who gets to analyze what, and uh, then we go off and we meet in two weeks. And that two weeks is where, where we hopefully will say we've got something for, on, for this particular hypothesis or this particular hypothesis. And uh, from that, then, we hope to uh, make a, a public announcement, et cetera, in, two, in a two-month time frame. So it's kind of two hours, two days, two weeks, two months. So when, what, you said, what you described is quite accurate. Um, we will be making presentations at the American Geophysical Union in San Francisco in December. Uh, and hopefully there, we can say something quite definitive. Uh, what those little blips mean? I'm just glad they're there, honestly, because that's, uh, it could have been a flat black line, and uh, it wasn't, and we're not the only ones who saw interesting blips, so we just got to go back and see what it is. It could be, honestly, it could be purely instrument. I don't think that flash is. Uh, I, I'm anxious to go back and see if I see an OH emission line, an H2O plus line, a sodium line, a whatever. Um, so we just got to get into it. Just haven't yet. Okay. Uh, we'll take one more question here in the audience, and then we'll take uh, the questions over uh, from the phone. Donald Robertson, Spaceflight London. Uh, what, um, it, how can you have a crater and no ejecta? If you don't see the ejecta, what does that tell you? And you do see a crater. What yeah, does that no, that's, a, that's a great question. And uh, I think we got a couple of theses uh, that people could write here on that. Um, uh, so. The, the process of making a crater is pretty complex and not necessarily entirely understood. Uh, we have some of the, the world experts in the audience here who are on the team. Um, what would that mean to me? One, uh, the ejecta did not fly up high enough. We hit a slope, we hit some blocks that careened the ejecta laterally. Um, I, we've actually seen this work in the other way, gotten lucky and hit a slope in the right direction and careened the ejecta upward. Um, so. Uh, there's that. There's some just, unfortunately, luck that, that has to come in here to get the ejector to fly in the direction you want it to fly. Um, there is the type of material you hit. Is it bedrock or is it consolidated? Is it compressible? Uh, that, are the, we don't really know. This is part of this experiment tells us that. Uh, there's uh, uh, the composition of the material itself how the energy coupled to it and how actually the energy propagated through the sound waves and actually lift the material up. We just don't know exactly how that works necessarily for all the possibilities on the moon. Um, and there's the possibility that the shadow heights were deeper than we thought they were. 
You know, we, we're, we're basing this on the latest and best available data, and we just need to go back and take a look at all of it. Uh, there's explanations for sure how you can have a crater. Uh, we saw a crater, we saw a flash, so that something had to happen in between. And we're going to go find, and, and we see it in the spectrometers. That's what's very, you know, we do see something in the spectrometers. It's, I, I don't know what it is. I'm not going to say it's the ejecta cloud right now, but something happened in between. We just got to go back and, and with a finer tooth comb. And if I can just <clears throat> make a quick comment. What you're seeing here is this is what exploration is. You know, the, the, these areas haven't seen the light of the sun for some estimate up to two billion years. So if we don't have that kind of information, we make uh, estimates and we plan as best we can, but you take the results of the experiment and you move from there. And you start to use those results to constrain what the answer might look like. So you're right in the middle of it with us uh, <laughs> in, uh, in trying to understand this. OK. Thank you very much. Now we'll take the a question from uh, Dan Verigano with USA Today. Dan? Thanks very, very much. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, could you speak a little about, uh, more about what you'd lose with the plume not raising into sunlight? My understanding was there's some cooking of the ingredients that would tell you something. Some, uh, re repeat the last part of the question. The what? Right. What, it wasn't part of the plume, uh, the intent of creating it was that it would so, rise so, above the crater wall and into sunlight and you would have see some reactions there that might give you some more information. Well, yeah, you know, notionally, if, if for example, you have cold ejecta and you want to bring it into sunlight, one, you can see if there's ice in the ejecta or you yes. can see if there's subliming water. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the things you, you, you hope for now. That doesn't mean that didn't happen. It means maybe uh, it, it was much fainter, more diffuse. Uh, that, uh, this gets to you know the, the earlier question about well, if you didn't see ejecting, you saw a crater. What it means? Even just the flight angle of the ejecta can make the the cloud less dense, uh, you know, than what we had thought it was going to be or whatever. So we just need to be careful and and one say we just don't know right now what 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 we saw entirely, but uh, what uh, what what I don't think you necessarily lose any information with regards to understanding what it is is there. It would have been, you know, assuming we had no ejecta, it, it would have been a very nice thing to have. But the fact that we got good spectroscopic data, and I mean ejecta in cameras, we got the spectroscopic data, and that's what really matters. So something occurred in the sunlight or from the heat from the crater. The fact that we flew in, saw the crater, and it was still glowing hot, uh, means that if, if there was ice there or absorbed water or whatever else, it was subliming. Um, uh, so we just we need to go back and take a look. Thanks very much. Okay. My second question was whether you could say anything about this mission as a model for future missions. That a lot's been made of this being off-the-shelf technology and that sort of thing. Would you be able to do something identical to this to explore a near-Earth asteroid for its contents, or is this just a special situation with El Cross that you're able to do? Please. Um, yeah, this, this is actually something that is being considered. Um, this is a really novel approach. Um, as far as spacecraft complexity goes, I mean, spacecraft can be uh, very complicated things and pretty unforgiving because once you let go of them, um, you can't go back and fix them. And so uh, keeping your complexity as low as possible, keeping everything as simple as possible, um, helps keep your risks down. And I think that's why this mission has been so successful in how quickly it turned around, how quickly we got it up and uh, able to be launched. And, and the mission, even through some trouble spots, was able to uh, complete. Uh, so I think this is a great paradigm. Um, and I think it is extensible. I think it could be applied to other mission types and so forth. Absolutely. OK, uh, we're starting to run out of time here. So we'll take our last two people. Uh, Seth Bornstein from AP. Uh, thank Go you ahead. for doing this. Just more ejecta questions. First, um, can you say that, uh, is, is it fair to say while you have absolutely no images so far of the ejecta visually, the spectroscopic data is confirms the ejecta, and can you, from that spectroscopic data, can you say how far the ejecta reached or how big a plume you had just from that data? And then can you just say whether you're I mean, the public was somewhat disappointed, as, uh, as my colleague at the LA Times said, 
Could, are you somewhat disappointed and surprised by the lack of visual uh, data on the, on the plume? Uh, the first, uh, I'll take the last one first and, and, and then comment uh, more detail on the, on the first question. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm, I'm not necessarily surprised because I knew I would be surprised, if that makes any sense. I knew we were going someplace that to expect what you're not going to expect. And, and so that's why we really try to build this as robust as possible in terms of measuring every possible aspect in, ten, in, in case any one of them didn't work, like the flash didn't work or we couldn't see the crater or the ejecta was hard to see. I'm not convinced we haven't seen the ejecta. Um, we'll, we, I want to go back to those images and, and look at them carefully. Uh, what you saw was, you know, uh, about 15, 20 minutes of uh, my efforts with the images uh, while my team worked uh, other aspects and we're going to work on that t this afternoon and tomorrow so okay. stay tuned you know I, I certainly hope we can uh, dig something out of there um, that that will be telling uh, you know you, j you just never know how these things are going to go and, and as we said our emphasis was on the spectra that's where the information is uh, I'm very hopeful but I'm not going to say I'm uh, uh, unequivocally certain that we have curtain spectra. I can say I am uh, very confident we have uh, flash spectra. Uh, that's, that's certain and, uh, and, and it looks promising beyond that. But again, I just have to go back and, and do more than a once over uh, uh, with, with you know, total radiance uh, measurements. Yeah, this may sound really obvious, but this isn't the end. This is the beginning. Uh, there's an awful lot of work that still needs to be done. And uh, for those of you who've uh, conducted experiments in the past, to have something uh, absolutely certain right after you're done with the experiment is uh, not the way uh, most scientists have, uh, have experienced the results of their experiments. If there's anything I would add to that, the one thing I was surprised by was how quick four minutes goes by. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that was the one thing that I really noticed was, okay, here's flash. We're halfway through curtain. Wait, 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 what happened? And then cr crater, oh, there it goes. Wow. Yeah. Um, okay. Get ready for the press conference. You know, that's, that's ba basically how it went. Okay, we have uh, only a couple more minutes left. Uh, we'll take our last question from Arle Irene Klotz from this. Irene Klotz? Thanks very much. Oh. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, uh, congratulations, first of all. I have two questions. Um, the first, I'm afraid I'm going to display my scientific ignorance, but could you explain why this sodium um, measurement popped out to the point where you're even mentioning it at this press conference? Uh, I, I can comment that, and possibly Jen and, and Mike could too. Uh, the, we don't understand right now how the lunar exosphere works. And the exosphere is the atmosphere, uh, the th very tenuous atmosphere around the moon. Uh, it is, there's a variety of theories, and m most recently you've heard about the, the observations of uh, very small amounts of hydroxyls and waters near the surface in sunlight. Uh, how that might move around is through this atmosphere. Uh, the fact that we saw a sodium line means uh, that something was thermalized down in the crater when we hit it, Temperatures got hot enough, reacted with the surface perhaps, or reacted with the atmosphere, ambient atmosphere, enough to excite sodium atoms. Uh, sodium atoms exist naturally in the lunar atmosphere. Uh, why an impact like this would excite it is a good question, and that's something we're really going to follow up on. Uh, sodium is easy to observe from Earth. It's a very strong line in the visible. Uh, we, uh, on HST and on uh, our Shepping spacecraft, can see a variety of other emission lines that are more indicative of other interesting things like water. And so that's, you know, we'll have to go back and see what we see in there. So yeah. the fact that we saw a sodium line is exciting okay. because it means we did excite something in the crater and it did express itself such that we can measure it. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the panelists for all their hard work. And I know you guys are going to get some sleep and then look at this data with uh, new eyes, rested eyes. OK, I know everyone here is going to be waiting for these results. Any new results we will have will be posted on the LCROSS website, www.nasa.gov slash LCROSS. And with that, thank you very much. This is. Uh, this is goodbye from NASA Ames Research Center. Thank you.